presence. We've even heard testimonies uh, today of your provision, the way you provide for us. And you are generous to us and you love us. Open up our hearts where they may be closed. Melt our hearts where they may be stiffened towards you so that we can be open and generous, open-handed and open-hearted, like you, Jesus, like you. For your glory and your kingdom, we pray. Amen. I, I have, you know, the Bible says, boast of what the Lord has done. And I have, really, so many stories in my life of people being generous to me. I am just somebody who so have been so blessed by other people's generosity and have been a real recipient of um, people blessing me. And um, I'm, I'm going to pick one of my favorites because, because God is in the detail. God knows the details of our lives. What You may have heard this before. I'm only going to tell part of it. But when I, was, um, when I finished my studies, I, I was in Oxford, and we were put, you're put in this, we put in this monastic community for a few days for a silent retreat to prepare you for the ordination that people have, have on a Saturday. And it's, it can be quite a tense time. You're moving house, you're ending your studies, you're starting a new job. I remember feeling quite tense. And there was a sort of silent retreat. I sort of slipped out of the mon monastery. I, I went for a massage. I thought, I just, Lord, I really need... To, to de detox and relax. I remember doing, I went back to the monastery and carried on with the silent retreat. And then I, I realized that some of my friends were, who were praying for me would have written to me. Those were in the days, really I'm showing my age now, people used to write cards to each other or letters, you know? And that's the way it was. And I, and I sort of nipped up to my college and you had these sort of pigeonholes uh, where your mail was. Now, what I, I should have said to you previously was a few months earlier, I got a call from Church of England HQ, this lovely woman on the phone, and said, uh, Patrick, the bishop wants to know, have you got any debts? And I, I really wasn't expecting that question. And, and she said, but I, well, I do, actually. And I, I, I had £3,000 worth of debts, which is a th basically £1,000 for every year of my studies, which I thought, I used to, I, I was earning quite good money before I came into this, um, this sort of ministry, and I didn't think it was a lot. I think I, I could sort that out. But the lovely lady said, well, you can't get ordained with any debt. I thought, oh, that's interesting. So, so I prayed. And, and the short, short story is, the Lord, within a within very short time, gave me some work, some very generously paid work. And I think within 10 days of work, I'd paid off half of it. And, um, and then the, I had to tell the vicar why I was going to be a, a, a curate. And he said, well, what did you spend the money on? I said, well, I bought a laptop which I think at that time was £1,000, even then. He said, well, well, we'll pay for that. You're going you're gonna to need that when you're here. Anyway, there was £600 of this debt left. It was the week before I'm getting ordained. I was in the silent retreat. £600. I didn't even know if anyone was going to check up on me, but I, I was thinking, you know, I was imagining the bishop coming up the aisle at St Paul's and saying, can we just see your bank statement, Patrick? We just need to have a little look before we uh, lay on hands. But I didn't know what was going to happen. So I think it was either the day before or two days before. And I went up to my pigeonhole in my college. And I was on cards. People had been praying. And we're thinking of you, praying of you. And I opened it. I'll never forget this moment. I opened this, this card from a dear man called Tom, who was a tree surgeon, who actually cut down the trees that were in the way of building this church, because we later hired him. And in his card, he said, Patrick, I've been praying for you. And I don't know why, but I sense the Lord has asked me to give you this. And in that envelope was a check for £600. To the penny that I needed to satisfy the bishop's needs to get ordained. Now, I could honestly tell you dozens of stories like this, where God always provides what we need because he is generous. And I am. I, I, I have an embarrassment of riches. And perhaps many of you have these stories too. And today I want to talk to you um, about God's generosity. You can pop back, actually. Uh, God is generous to us. God is generous to us. He's given us his best, Jesus, his son. God calls us to be generous to him. Christ-like generosity will transform your life and the lives of those around you. And fourthly, what can I do? How can I respond? You know, God's, God's uh, idea of generosity is so much greater than we can possibly imagine. Jesus teaches about forgiveness and giving 
in the same breath. Luke chapter 6. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over, will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Now that is a promise. That is a promise from Jesus. So that kind of should be a little light for us. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Now I want you to learn that promise. If people say to you today, what did Patrick talk about? You can just say that. That's really, for with the measure, let's say, say after me, for with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Now that is a, that is a, a beautiful truth that will help you in your financial planning. It's a promise. You know, Jesus says when you start being generous, God will see that you receive a generous portion too. He doesn't say, it's not prosperity, it's, not, I mean, it's the only caveat I have really, he doesn't say, give so you can get rich. He doesn't say that. He says, the Bible says he's generous. He wants you to be generous so that he can be generous to you. And there's a link. As you sow, so you shall reap. Now, Jesus it really says the way we meet the world, how we forgive others, how much we give away, will directly affect what we receive. Jesus tells us that God is the great giver. A good measure, I mean, I love that. A good measure, um, you go back, sorry, go back. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. And that's really a picture It's a picture of the marketplace. It's an agricultural metaphor because when Jesus, you know, that's what people were given. You know, they were given these measures and sometimes people would gather them up in their skirts. You know, a woman would go out with her skirts and they'd be poured into their skirt if she didn't have a bag. You know, a measure we poured down. And and, and you wanted wanted it to be pressed down and you wanted it to be shaken together so there's no space. And then you wanted to keep on pouring so it's running over. It's just a wonderful, extravagant measure of what good, good God's goodness is like. You know, God, God is so extravagant in his generosity. It never runs out. It's a, picture of a, it's a picture of abundance. You know, I love those sunflowers. It never runs out. His abundance goes on and on. He's always sufficient. And yet, there's always a temptation. There's a temptation. And the problem is that we don't, we really don't really believe that God is good all the time. We may give lip service to it, but we may doubt that he'll be generous to us personally. So this can lead us not to be generous. It may make us withhold from him. It may make us anxious. It may make us close our hands and not be so giving. And so instead of receiving more, we receive less. And we go in a diminishing cycle. Anyone recognize that? Now, how can we remind ourselves about God's goodness and generosity? How can we keep that front and center? We only need to look at the cross. We just need to look at the cross. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Everything, everything we want to know about God really begins there. God so loves you that he gives the very best of himself, his one and only Son. to die in your place and mine. And Jesus, you know, went willingly to the cross, bloody and horrific though it was. He says, Father, not your will be done. Not my will be done, sorry. Not my will be done, but your will be done. Not my will, but yours. This is what you want. I will not withhold myself. And the Father says, I will not withhold you either. So that, 
God gives the very best of himself. Now, you've heard it a hundred times, but I... God so loves the world that he gives his one and only son. So that's, that's another promise. That's another promise. And when we keep that second promise close to the first promise, then we'll become more generous in the way we live. Now, if we really believe those things, we don't just pay lip service to them, they will begin to transform our hearts. Now, I wonder how often you have been the uh, recipient of amazing generosity. You know, I I have so many times, and even before I got ordained, but really since following Jesus, beginning to walk in a different way of life, it was as almost the the Lord opened a door, a, a new realm in my life of generosity. I've got so many embarrassing stories of God being kind to me and my family. On on the one one hand, I'm often amazed. On the other hand, I've come to see it as God's provision in my life. I remember some years ago, many years ago, being invited to a conference in America. There was this sort of revival going on in in Washington State. Uh, I went with some uh, Christian leaders to, we flew to Seattle, and then we we, we were driven to Tacoma, and there was this big revival breaking out. Uh, But one of the things that was happening in this church is they were learning new levels of generosity. It was like a fruit of their revival. So all the people in that church, there were hundreds of people from all over the globe coming to this conference, but the people in that church vacated their homes. Some of them went to, to, to go into B&B, some stayed with family. They vacated their homes, they filled their fridges with food, and they lent us their cars, and they, and they chauffeured us around, and they just overwhelmed us with this generosity. And I remember being just kind of blown away I really did, I sort of didn't have the vocabulary for it, but it was very touching, but it was a sign that they had understood um, God's generosity to them, and they wanted it to be, you know, pouring through them to others. And I'll never forget, I actually went several times to these conferences, and once I was staying with my friend Nick, who'd come to faith through Alpha, and we'd become good friends, we were billeted with this couple who I'd say were pretty wealthy. I mean, they had their house was kind of the house was kind of modest, but they had a lot of grown-up toys. By which I mean, we had this bizarre conversation in their garden where, where she sort of said, the wife said, um, "Bob, do you think that they would like, to, you know, would they like to go out for a ride?" I don't know, Phil Murray. We should we should ask them. But I wonder if, if they, we should take them up and they should have a look. Well, what do you think? Uh, why don't we just ask them? And then they said. Um, Patrick and Nick, would you like to go up in the plane? We're like, what? <laughs> we, we have a plane. We just wonder if you'd like to go for a ride. So, they, so they, took us, they took us to the airfield. They had their own plane, you know, and they'd been successful or whatever they did. And they took us with this ride over Seattle and Tacoma. And, we were sort of, and I said, can we go down? We saw where some of our friends were staying. Can we swoop down and look at the houses? <laughs> our friends had been billeted. And we flew back. And, and, and they had about three or four cars. You know, these were wealthy Americans. And they had some big RVs, like coaches, what we would call coaches, but with beds and fridges and ovens and what we would probably do, camp, luxury camping, they had these RVs. Anyway, one day we, we, liked to, we wanted to have, we had a break, we thought we'd go to Seattle. We thought, we were talking about whether they'd lend us a car. And, and, and Bob said, yeah, sure, take the pickup. There's a beautiful pickup on the drive. And then Thelma said, um, very cross, and, and, and gestured that Bob come and talk. And we gave them the room. And we could overhear Bob telling Thelma off because he was offering us the pickup and they had this big stretch white Mercedes, like a big sedan on the drive. He said, you will, you will give them the Mercedes, that Jesus' Mercedes and you will give them the... I said, right Thelma, no, I, I understand. Of course they can have... So we had this embarrassing moment where we, we had to say yes. We are quite happy with the pickup but we wanted them to be happy so we ended up driving this big stretch Mercedes like kings into Seattle but I really felt... It was, a, it was a comedic situation. The, the Lord, they were just learning about being more generous with the amount of wealth they have. That God wanted them to share the best that they had with others. And Nick still and I still chuckle about that. Uh, yeah, yeah, that was a beautiful moment. Um, so... They understood, really, that God had given them everything, and everything they had came from Jesus, and they wanted to share it. And I'm I'm often reminded of them to be more generous. Now, while sometimes I can sense in me the insecurity that wants to make me less generous, I wonder if you ever feel that. 
and, and less like Jesus. There are times when I felt the joy of just giving money and possessions away. And when you give things away that are really precious to you, it will give you great joy. I remember being in a church meeting once and all these uh, men who were recovering from alcoholism and addiction came in to give their testimonies. And I had, the only time I ever had an expensive watch. <laughs> I never really had an expensive watch. At that time, I had an expensive watch. And the Lord just said to me, I want you to give that watch to that man. I want that man to have your watch. I remember giving away this watch. And, and I, I, didn't, I didn't hesitate because I knew it was the Lord. And actually, he, this man was so big, I had to go and find the extra links because he had such a, I got a skinny wrist. He had these big, big wrists. And uh, I got this joy giving this away to him. He got my watch because it was the Lord's watch. And other times I've been in Sainsbury's around Christmas and the Lord has shown me that people are struggling to pay their shopping. And the Lord just said to me, I want you to pay for their shopping. Don't make a fuss about it, just go and pay their shopping. And then the joy has come. Now, I know it's not, I don't feel happy telling you this story because it sounds like I'm blowing my trumpet, but I'm not, I'm just trying to tell you what the Lord has done for me. He asked me to do this. And I've got to be honest, often I fall into a lack of generosity, and I fall back into anxiety and not giving. But when I step into what he asked me to do, joy comes, and more generosity comes my way. And I, I've got so many stories like this. The Lord says, Patrick, I just want you to pay for that person. I want you to pay for their holiday. I meet someone in the supermarket, I want you to give them a check. And when we're open like that, the Lord will surprise us. He wants us to be the means. And, and you just cannot outgive God. You cannot outgive him, but joy. He, he always pays back. He always pays back. He outgives me. He'll outgive you. Ash, Alex uh, read to us this morning from Alakai. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, and there may be food in my house. Test me. That's it. Keep the joy up there. Test me in this. Keep, keep, keep the joy. Test me in this. Uh, actually, what's the next slide? You're probably doing the right thing. Yes, you're right. You're, you're, I'm off. Test me in this. Now, you know, test me. That, as far as I know, is the only place in the whole of Scripture that, that gee, God says, test me. Generally, it says, he says, don't test me. And the one place he says to test me is in your giving. Giving away what you've got. Test me. See how generous I am. You're never going to outgive me. Test me. Now, I should have started this talk, is that if you are giving to this church, if you're a regular giver, I want to say thank you. Thank you for being part of this adventure of giving. Well done. Well done, good and faithful servant. Now, if you came to the lunch, a few weeks ago we had a splendid lunch, about 100 or so people came for lunch, you may have wondered who paid for that lunch. Well, that lunch was paid, by, paid for by the people who give in this church, the people who give regularly. Well, they paid for the lunch. So if you were part of that group, you know, don't worry if you're not yet. That's why I'm giving this talk. All right? And be, it's, a, it's, a, it's a short series, and Fumi's going to give another one. Because I want everyone in this church not to miss out on the adventure of giving. But, you know, if, if you were not part of that giving, then, then those here paid for your lunch. And that's okay. You were a recipient of their generosity. Now, if you're here for that dedication day, you may have thought, who paid for the church? Well, the people here giving did not pay for the church. The people who paid for the church building were the people who lived here 100 years ago, over 100 years ago. They gave their tithes and their offerings sacrificially. Now, some of them were very poor. I looked into it. Some of them were poor, like the widow at the temple in the reading we had today. And they gave their coppers and their, their farthings, and they paid for this land. And we developed this land and borrowed some money and had a, a smart bit of financial uh, shenan well, I won't say shenanigans because it was all up front and pretty transparent. And we built some flats and that paid. Okay? So the people who lived a few generations ago paid for, the, paid for the land, and the people who are giving now paid for the lunch. Are you with me? Okay. It's good to know who pays for what, right? I like to know. I know you do too. Jesus says, God says, test me in this and see if I will not open the flood goats. So flood, flood, not the flood goats. We don't want the flood goats. We want the flood gates. The flood gates of heaven and pour out so much blessing there'll be not room enough to store it. It'll prevent the pest from devouring your crops, fruit, vines in your fields will not drop their fruit before it's ripe. 
But look, he says, then the nations will call you blessed, for yours will be a delightful land. And this is the thing, friends, about giving. Giving and generosity leads to delight. It just leads to joy. And if you're lacking joy, maybe think about giving, being more generous, because I promise you, joy follows. All right? Now, we're getting, we're getting there. We're getting there. Now, near the end of every year, tax year, I have a conversation with my accountant. And I, because I'm, I'm a clergyman, you have these special rules. I won't bore you with them. Uh, and together, we work out how much money I've given away uh, to charity in the last 12 months. And if it feels like a good year, then I should have given really at more than I gave the year before. And usually, I give away... I'm going to just be honest with you, about 11 to 12% of my church salary or stipend, sometimes more. I, I want to tell you not to boast, but to say that something the Lord has taught me, it could certainly be more. Then out of that giving, more than half comes to St. Peter's, because that's my first place of giving. And the rest is spread around other charities I give to, uh, like Christian Aid and Christian Solidarity, and my children and I sponsor a little girl in Kenya, you know, because God's been good to us. So we want to be good to others. We bless people, and God just keeps blessing us. And I think of it as sowing into God's kingdom. And I could do more, but that's the base of what I do. Jesus said of this church, the gates of hell shall not prevail. It's an amazing thing. You know, the Roman Empire fell. And, you know, I love watching things like about the Roman Empire, the Byzantine. All these empires fell. But Jesus said, the gates of hell shall not prevail against my, my church. And that's you, my gathered people. The gates of hell should not prevail. And the church has funded the church through the centuries. And I want you all to be part of that adventure, really. Now, I'm going to finish by... I can't have to say all those things. I can't have that much to say. I'm going to probably finish before this, what I've written down, so don't be frightened. I brought a loaf of bread here. Because I know, you know, visually, I think it really helps if we can see what I'm talking about. And this is what I do, and this is what I believe God calls us to do. Now, I bought a loaf of bread. It might fall off. I don't mind if it falls off. It doesn't matter. You can still see the bread. And, um, you know, this loaf of bread, sort of, it, it really represents my income. All right? It could represent your income. If you're on benefits, if you're on a pension of your income, that can represent your income. And at the beginning of the year, I look at my income, and I, I do this with my, account, with my accountants, and I can look at my income, or I can look at last income. And the first thing I, de- the first thing I do is I decide how much I'm going to give away. What's the amount? What I do is I, I look at what I've got, I pray, I think about it, I pray some more, and then I decide to give. Let's say I give two slices. Usually I do, and usually the Lord then prompts me and says, I want you to be a bit more generous. I give another slice. All right? Now, why is it important? Because that way I'm giving the first fruits of what God gives me away. If I don't do that, and if I spend all my money, at the end of the year, that's all I'll give him what's left. That's not the same thing. Giving him my leftovers... Do we want God to be a God of our leftovers? Or do we, do we really believe the things we say? That we give him the first thing that we have? Now, everything I have belongs to him anyway. You know, I can't take anything out. You know, I've had many of my friends die now in their 50s, and I, I think about those things. I think I want to leave enough for my kids, but I can't take anything with me. So I take that, and I give to the Lord. And that's what I believe he encourages us to do, to give the first part of our giving to him. And, and, and when you start to do that as a way of life and you're excited by it, joy comes. Joy comes. And, and your life, I, I, I just give you my, this is my story. The Lord just gives more and more and then he gives me more and then I need to be more generous. You know? And I find the more generous, <laughs> the more he gives to me. Now I think that's, you know, I think that's pretty much, we can skip forward, Gabe. What can I do? I think that's pretty much what I wanted to talk about today. And I know, I don't apologise. I really don't. I've actually really enjoyed talking about it. You know why? Because I'm reminded of, of, of how God has been, been good to me. And um, I want to finish, because we're going to have a little time of prayer. Maybe we'll sing a song. I want to finish. 
is I want to say, I mean, I'm, I'm moving on in, in, you know, in next year. The reason this church is here is because people's generations ago gave. They gave sacrificially. Now, if you don't have very much money, that's okay. In the Bible, the person Jesus gives in his example of gen- g- generosity is the person with very little money. Jesus, I- I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come on a- over here to stand by a widow. And it's not that Violet is the poorest person, because I, I know you're not, Violet, and you're generous. But if Violet, Violet could be that widow, and she could be with very little means. And Jesus chooses that woman who puts those two copper coins in the treasury, and he actually takes his disciples, who are looking at all the wealthy people, he says, come and look at her. She's put everything in the treasury. And it's a picture of dependence. What he's saying is, everything she has, she's given to God. Now, because we're Western and we're anxious, what people tend to do is, oh my word, what happened to her? Hands up if you put, thought, what happened to her? What happened to her? Come on, a few of us thought, what happened to that woman who put all the money in? Because that's where Westerners and we're worrying about what's going on. Jesus doesn't want us to think about that because Jesus knows she's going to be okay. He says, look at how generous. He's not saying what happens to her because God's got her because she's got God. She's going to be okay. Now, So if you've got very little, it's okay. I'm not saying you have to put it all in. If you've never started giving to God, to the church, I'd say, start. and I know some people are here maybe for the first time, and you think, oh my word, I've come, and they're always talking about money. That's always the, the cliche, isn't it? But if you've never given, start with a little. George Muller said, when you give, if you've not given before, just start with the faith you've got. Give something. Give something, give a fiver. I remember when I first gave a fiver a month to the church. It felt good. You know, if, if, you're, if you're somebody with big income and small income because you're an artist, I used to live with an artist, you never knew where the money was, co- was going to come. But just give something until you work out what you can give. But give something. On your chairs, and I want you to grab one, if, you, if you're giving, thank you. On your chairs, Sarita's kindly printed up a form, and on one side there is... Uh, a pledge form, and you can find a pen. Take that with you. We'll talk about this again. Now, listen, don't, don't feel, don't give because I've said, don't feel pressured. If you don't want to give, I'm, I'm okay with that. And if you're miserable giving, don't give. Please don't give. The Bible says God loves a cheerful, a joyful, a h- hilarious giver. Okay? So if you're unhappy, don't to give. I'm just telling you this has changed my life and I don't want you to miss out about his generosity of giving. But fill in the form. uh, You'd have to set up a standing order. You can always give in the baskets. But the best way we plan financially is to give that way. And on the back is a covenant form so that the Chancellor gives back some of the tax you paid. All right, now that's it. Shall we stand? It's always hard to squeeze that into a short time. Let's stand. And I'd just love us just to... um, Take a moment, really, where you are. Amen on that.